What are distributed energies? We compare them to elite energies. Elite energies are simply elite because when you go home after this conference, I'll be willing to bet you that you don't have coal, oil, gas, or uranium in your backyard. They're elite because they're only found in certain parts of the world. They require huge military investments to secure them, huge geopolitical investments to manage them, and massive capital flows to organize them. Coal, oil, gas, uranium are the most centralized energies in all of human history. And I don't have to remind you here in the Netherlands how many millions and millions of human beings have died in wars in the first and second industrial revolution to secure coal, oil, gas, and uranium. Those are the dark undersides of a great civilization. What are distributed energies? Go home, you got it all in your backyard. You all know this because you're having a session. The sun shines all over the world every day. The wind blows across this planet every single day. Everywhere we walk, there's a hot core, geothermal core of heat under this earth. Wherever there's water, we have the possibility of hydroelectricity. In the rural areas, we've got agriculture and forestry waste ready to be converted. We all have our waste stream that can be converted back to energy. If we live on the coastal areas where most of our urban population does, those tides are coming in every single day. We call these distributed energies because they're found in some proportion in every square inch of the ocean and land of this earth, bathed by the sun. The European Union in 2007 committed itself to the four pillars of the, European, of the uh, Third Industrial Revolution. The European Parliament passed an historic declaration. And now it's being implemented, not fast enough, by the Commission. Where it's really going to be implemented is in the cities in this room. You know this, and I know that. The federal governments and Brussels can set up code standards, regulations, and incentives, but on the ground, it's going to happen in the urban areas and span out. What are the four pillars? Pillar one, the EU is committed to 20% renewable energy by 2020. There's, it's 2020, 20 in 2020, as you know. 20% global reduction of gases, 20% increase in energy efficiency. That's essential. We can't get to a third industrial revolution unless we do those two 20s. You have to get the efficiencies better and the thermodynamics down and the global warming reduced. But that is essential, but not sufficient because we're still in fossil fuels. Essential, not sufficient. It's the start of the new game. It's the end of the old one. The third 20 is the revolution. 20% renewable energies, a third of the electricity of Europe renewable by 2020, 500 million people from the Irish Sea to the doorsteps of Russia, done deal. Pillar one. But then we face the problem in Brussels, pillar two. How do we collect this energy? The first thought, well, let's find out where all the sun is. Italy, Greece, I was there last night. Italy, Greece, the Mediterranean. Build those big, huge centralized solar parks, ship it on high voltage smart lines across to Europe. The wind, let's go to Ireland, get all those wind farms off the coast, put a little voltage thing under the channel and send it out to Europe. You with me? I don't oppose centralized solar and wind. They're essential but not sufficient. They're transitional, they're not the new game. They're old thinking. We have to have them, but they're not the new thinking. They're based on the old thinking, because the old energies were centralized. They're only found in certain places, so you go there and organize and then send them along their merry way. But here's the point. If renewable energies are distributed and they're found in every square inch of this planet, why would we only collect them in a few central points? So I want us to think pillar two, buildings, buildings, buildings. The number one cause of climate change, buildings. They use a third of the energy, a third of the CO2. The number three cause of climate change, worldwide transport. Does anyone know, by the way, what the number two cause of climate change is? A little bit more specific. Cows. Beef production and consumption. I wrote a book on this called Beyond Beef in 1991. It was pilloried by the uh, ranchers and cattle industry in the U.S. They even stopped my book tour for security reasons. They said that's absurd. Number two, we now know this. Number two cause is beef production and consumption, yet not one government leader in 192 countries has made one single statement on the number two cause of climate change. Even Al Gore until last week, 
refused to talk about it. And then he was caught on a television interview. If we can't even talk about the number two cause of climate change because we're worried about it may be somehow uncomfortable, how are we going to address this? But the number one cause, buildings. Buildings are this problem. Buildings are the solution. By the way, I should say President Obama, you would be aghast if President Obama got in a Hummer and used it for a family recreation car, correct? Every Friday, he goes to his favorite hamburger joint with Vice President Biden, and they have photo ops while they eat these big hamburgers. Either he doesn't understand or doesn't know or doesn't care. Either way, we got a problem here. And your leaders in your countries are no different. Buildings. I want you to imagine that every single building in your city, every single building in this world that exists right now, current stock, every home, every factory, every technology park, every rural and urban building right now converted to a partial power plant within 25 years to jumpstart a massive global construction revolution based on new materials and design for renovation. The existing buildings. So let's say you have a home, you put a little solar roof, 10% of your electricity you get. You put a little vertical wind on your office, you get 20%. You put a heat pump under your technology park, you get 30%. Every building can become partial power plant. General Motors in Spain has the largest Opel factory in the world. It's in Saragossa. It produces a lot of cars. Last fall, they leased that little roof, pretty big roof, to Veolia, the French waste management company, 45 days later, they had slapped an entire photovoltaic power plant on that roof, $78 million, payback nine years. The S-curve tells us that if we did it three years from now, the payback would be four years. That roof produces 10 megawatts. That's enough electricity right now to power 4,700 homes on one roof. You know how much roof space there is in the great urban, suburban sprawls of this world? We haven't even begun. And they did this on their own. In Spain, stay in Spain, in Aragon, Spain, there's a technology park called the Walker Technology Park. It's nestled in the Pyrenees. It has 21st century buildings. It looks like a sci-fi movie. Microsoft uh, is in the park, many, many companies. They have wind turbines across the Pyrenees providing power. They get the snowdrift for hydroelectricity. They have solar collectors across the entire valley following the sun, and they're 80% off-grid. In June of this year, they'll be 100% off-grid. By the end of the year, positive power back to the grid. No help from Madrid or Brussels. Why can't that be done in every factory and technology park in the world? Tomorrow morning. They didn't get any help. Olivia Buig sat me down last year in Fran Paris, the great construction company, showed me a drop-dead office complex in the Paris suburbs. It's going up right now. It's so architecturally sophisticated, it collects more sun than it needs, sends power back to the grid. Spain is leading in the positive power buildings, Axiona. 